But I want to begin with just a couple of questions, hopefully, that will get you thinking in that direction. Do you know someone that is struggling with their faith? Maybe someone who is on the verge of walking away. I want you to think about that for just a moment. A brother or a sister in Christ who's struggling. Maybe to the point of saying, I just don't think I can do this anymore. My question is, how do you encourage that person? Have you encouraged that person? Have you gone to that person and said, listen, we don't want to lose you. Don't want you to leave. And, and, and if they have already drifted away, how do you draw them back? How do you bring them back into the fold? What Peter wrote in his second letter is a, a treatise, if you will, on, first of all, how to strengthen the faithful. Because the Christians to whom he's writing are Christians who are struggling. They're, they're facing a great deal of persecution. And so he is addressing that and working to encourage them so that they don't drift away, that they don't fall by the wayside. And if you'll notice how he begins the letter, I find it interesting. He says, Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice something he doesn't do. He doesn't begin by saying, Simon Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, that asserts his authority. I'm one of those disciples, one of those men he chose to disciple and then send out to preach the gospel. He doesn't start with that. He starts with the fact that he's a bondservant. Some of your translations simply say servant. Literally, he says slave. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And, and then, based upon that, he begins to address the Christians. And if you'll notice, to those, he's writing, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of God and Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, you, I'm writing to those of you who have the same precious faith that I have, the people who have the same belief that I have and what he adds to that if you'll notice there in verse 2 is grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord grace and peace that's the way Paul would start a lot of his letters grace and peace Peter says grace and peace be multiplied to you multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus the more you realize what God and Jesus have done for you, the more that I will hope that that grace that God has extended to you and the peace that is brought to you in Christ Jesus is just going to grow and grow and grow. And then from there, as you continue through what he writes, he proceeds to write to them of two things in this section that we're studying this week. One has to do with what God has given to Peter and to those Christians in Asia Minor, and to us by extension. And the second part of this, our section that he looks at is a need. A need that they have to grow, to develop in their faith and in their life, in these new lives in Christ. What we're looking at today was written almost 2,000 years ago. But yet, the things that he is saying to us in what he's writing here, and that he said to them so long ago, are about what God has given to us, and what we can do in our own lives, and what we can help others do in their lives, so that they grow. And I say these things, and I, I, I want to share this with you, because if you go to the end of our text, and you look again, and we'll look at that as we get to the end of the lesson this morning, I want for each one of you, and I believe you want it for yourself that your entrance into that eternal kingdom that Peter speaks about at the end, the Lord's eternal kingdom, may be abundantly supplied to you. To know, I have a home prepared where the saints abide just over in glory land, and I long to be by my Savior's side just over in glory land. We sing that. But do we believe it? And do we long for it? And are we willing to live our lives here in such a way that one day that is going to be our, ours? That promise is going to be fulfilled in our lives. So he begins by telling us what God has given to us. 
And what is it that God has given? Two things he brings out. One, he has given us everything that you and I need to live godly lives. Everything that we need to live godly lives. Everything, as he says, pertaining to life and godliness. And we have no excuse for not living a godly life if God has given us everything that we need to do so. Where's that come from? Everything that he's given, where's it come from? Peter says from his divine power. His divine power, he says, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. And he tells us how that power is made available to us. He says it is made available to us through the New American Standard says true knowledge. Most of your translations just say the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. If you go back to the first letter that we studied, 1 Peter, and you go back to chapter 2 and verse 9, there's a statement that Peter makes there that he has called us out of darkness into what he calls his marvelous light. This is what God has done. And then just two weeks ago as we finished that letter over in chapter 5, verse 10, he says something else. He tells us that God has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. But the truth is, there's not a single one of us here that can achieve that on our own. That eternal glory, living in that marvelous light by ourselves. You know why? Because there is someone working against us every single hour of every day to keep us from achieving that. He's the one that Peter calls our adversary, the devil. And his schemes, his ongoing schemes, are working constantly to prevent you from achieving what God wants you to achieve. And so it's only as we stand in the strength which God provides, as we put on what Paul calls the full armor of God, that we're able to withstand. And Peter tells us here that this divine power, which is enables us to be able to accomplish these things, is made possible to us through what he calls the true knowledge of him, that is, of God. In Jesus' prayer with the disciples in the upper room that's recorded for us in John chapter 17, Jesus makes a statement in this prayer in which he says down in verse 3 that he says, this is eternal life. And then he tells us what eternal life is. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Folks, that's eternal life. When Peter talks about the true knowledge of God, it is to know God and to know Christ and to know what God has done for us through Christ. And so what Peter begins by saying is, listen, God has made available to you through His divine power these precious, these, this, this ability to live these godly lives, everything pertaining to life and godliness. But then he adds something else to that. He talks about something else that God has given us. And he says it's these precious and magnificent promises. And what he says about these promises, if you'll notice there in verse 4, is that it is through them that we can escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. Corruption. The corruption that's in the world. Some translations say lust, some translations say evil desire, some translations say sinful desire. But that word that is translated lust is a word that's found 38 times in the New Testament and only three of those times is it used in a positive sense. As a matter of fact, if anything, we're warned to stay away from it, to, to guard ourselves against it. Um, Paul told Timothy over in 2 Timothy 2 verse 22 to flee youthful lust. In his letter to Titus, he told Titus that there was a point at which each one of us we're enslaved, he says, to various lusts. And then if you look at what James says in his, his epistle, James chapter 1, down in verse 14, he talks about how we are tempted when we are carried away by what? Our own lust. And in the very next verse, he, he kind of gives us 
an indication of how that plays out in our lives because in verse 15, he will add to that that when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. He's not talking about just physical death. He's talking about eternal separation from God. And then, do you remember what we're told to do? To love not the world, as John says in 1 John 2, or verse 15, Love not the world, neither things are in the world. And he tells us why. That if we love the world, we don't love the Father. And all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, said it's not from the Father, it's of the world. And the world and its lust are passing away, but he who does the will of God will live forever. So the idea is, if you allow yourself to be taken in by the lust and the desires of the world, it's going to lead you away from God. That's where the corruption comes from. And yet it's through these precious and magnificent promises that Peter says we're able to escape such an end in our lives. And the reason we're able to escape is because of what happens to us that Peter brings out. What happened when you became a Christian Peter says, you became a partaker of the divine nature. Think about that for just a moment. When you obeyed the gospel, when you put Christ on in baptism, something changed about you. What was it that changed? If you go back to what Peter preached in his first sermon, when, he, when they asked him, what shall we do there in Acts chapter 2? And he says, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the idea of becoming a partaker of the divine nature. Jesus put it another way back in... John's Gospel, chapter 14, he's with the disciples in that upper room, and he says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And that's why Paul would later write to the church in Corinth on two occasions. First of all, in chapter 3, verse 16, when he's speaking to the church as a whole, do you not know that your body, speaking about the church body, is a temple or is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then you come to chapter 6 and he re-emphasizes that, but this time it's to the individual Christian. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have in you, and as he says, from God. So you are a partaker of the divine nature. And what is that divine nature working to accomplish in your life? Another passage, second letter that Paul writes to the Corinthians, chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 13. He talks about how we behold as in a mirror dimly the glory of the Lord. And he talks about how we're being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Paul told the Christians at Colossae that Christ in you is your hope of glory. Christ in you, dwelling in you, is your hope of glory. That's why it's so important that you become that partaker of the divine nature, that you are becoming more like Him in your life and in the way you live on a daily basis. But He's been talking about all of this. He talks about what He's given us. There are these precious and divine promises which make all this available. And He doesn't emphasize these or go into any description here in His second letter. But if you go back to His first letter and you begin reading that first chapter, oh, He spells them out. Because what you find there, and I'm just kind of walk you through some of these in verse 9, Precious promises, the salvation of your souls. Or in verse 3, he talks about how God has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
So you have the salvation of your souls. You have a living hope, one that does not die. It just keeps on living on. And another one, if you'll look in verse 4 there, is it's God's promise of an inheritance for you that is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you. And then another one of those promises in verse 7, he speaks of the praise and the glory and the honor which will be ours at the revelation of Jesus Christ on the last day. These are the promises. Peter just kind of stacks them up. This is what God has promised to do for you. This is what God is promising he is going to bring to pass on your behalf. So we have two things. We have everything we need to live a godly life. We have these precious and magnificent promises that God has given to us and made to us. All of this is to enable us to live the life that God calls us to live, but we have to do something. We can't just sit back, I'm a Christian now, and I just let everything, God, just take over, take control, do whatever you will. No, God says, you have got to do something too. And because, he says, for this very reason, because of all this that God has done on your behalf, what he's done to help you live a godly life, the, the precious, magnificent promises he's granted to us, the fact that we are partakers of div his divine nature, we are called upon to develop in our lives certain qualities, virtues, if you will. And the thing that Peter says about these virtues, folks, is that they're very, very important. They are something that require, they, they are things that require our greatest effort as a matter of fact, he says in the New American Standard, supplying all diligence. Okay? Supplying all diligence. We start with a building block and we just kind of add to it and we expand one to reach the other and we just keep going that way. What are they? There are eight virtues he brings out. First one is faith. Faith. And you know, what is faith? As Peter's using it, it's our, it's our faithful commit, it's faithfulness and commitment to God through Jesus Christ. Faith is the foundation of our lives in Christ. As a matter of fact, we are told by the Hebrew writer that without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Jesus himself even said that unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, as Larry brought out to us last week in his sermon. It's what separates us from those who aren't in Christ, our faith. It is the victory, as Kyle shared with us last Sunday night, that overcomes the world. Faith. It's, our, it's where we start. Faith. Do you believe what you profess to believe? Do you believe the things you read in Scripture? Do you believe the things that God has taught you and told you through His inspired Word? Because if you don't believe that, none of the rest of this is going to add up if you don't believe what God has said. And so you add to that faith something else. You add to it, the old King James says virtue. New American Standard says moral excellence. Some translations say goodness. And the goodness is not what we mean when we say, oh, they're a good person. Because you see, in God's eyes, no one is good. It's referring to that moral excellence in our lives. It is that effort that we make to emulate God. Remember what Paul says, Be emulate me or imitate me even as I also imitate Christ Jesus there in 1 Corinthians 11.1. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to strive for that excellence that we see in our Lord and Savior. So we've got faith. We've got moral excellence or virtue. And then we add to that knowledge. Long ago it was Solomon who said in Proverbs 1 verse 7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and and instruction. Knowledge 
as Solomon tells us, is that wisdom and instruction which we as Christians need to live a virtuous life. Have you ever engaged in something, tried to do something without the instructions? Without the understanding of how it's supposed to work? Maybe you had enough, you know, uh, just the ability just to look at it and visualize it in your mind so that you knew what you needed to do and you went ahead and you were able to do it without much trouble. But a lot of us, I'm sure, are those we started into it and then we get through and we find out, oh, this isn't working the way I was supposed to. So I've got too many pieces left over. Something's not right. Years ago, my father-in-law ordered one of these three-wheeled bicycles, or well, tri you call them a trike now, you know, the adult. And he started putting it together up in Nashville. He kept looking for instructions, looking for instructions, couldn't find any, so he just starts trying to figure out where everything goes. He finally gets it put together, and he starts picking up the box to throw it away, and in the bottom under another piece of cardboard was the CD that had all of the instructions about how to put it together. Fortunately for him, he didn't end up with too many parts left over. But you see, knowledge of God's Word, knowledge which results in producing His character in our lives. So we have faith. We have that moral excellence. We have knowledge. We have added to all of that, building on this, he says, is self-control. Self-control is the opposite of self-indulgence. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to live life the way I want to live it. Don't anyone try to tell me how to do different. And in the world today, too many people are controlled by their passions and their desires. The entertainment industry and the advertising industry understand that all too well. They study you. They find out what you like and what you don't like and what you want and what you don't want and, and all of these things and they target that and they draw you in a direction that they want you to go. And yet as Christians, we have to learn to say no to our sinful passions and, and, and desires and we work to develop that self-control for the sake of Christ because I'm pressing on the upward way. I don't have time for these things. This isn't going to get me to heaven. So I'm looking for that which directs my life in the way it should go. And to our, our knowledge and self-control, we add perseverance. The ability to endure, to keep on keeping on, not to quit. You know, it's easy to quit. All you've got to do is say, I'm done. And I'm sure you know people in your own life that have quit. People have quit when we were in grade school. I, I don't want to play this game. I'm not going to play anymore. I quit. People in high school, maybe it's a certain class, or I'm dropping this class in college. I'm dropping this class too hard. Don't want to take that class. In high school, I don't want to play that sport anymore. I don't like this. I don't like that. We quit. We quit. We quit. But in life... We have to keep pressing on. We can't just quit. And when it comes to living a life that honors God, living a life that longs for an eternal life with God, we have to keep fighting a battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. It's not an athletic contest. It is a spiritual battle in which Satan is determined to cause you to give up, to quit, to walk away. And yet if we're going to make it, we've got to endure. We've got to keep pressing on and stand firm in our commitment to Christ in the face of the persecution that Satan will bring against us. Paul, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right at the end of that chapter, great chapter on the resurrection, he said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your toil or your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, what Paul is saying is don't quit. You keep on. You stay the course. You endure. You press on. To our perseverance, we add godliness. What is godliness? It is the desire to be godlike, but it is a reverence for God, a respect for God. Instead of pursuing the latest fad or fashion, we live these what Paul calls tranquil and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. Paul even told Timothy that godliness 
is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And then, on top of that, we add brotherly kindness. We treat each other as family. We're part of a family that's been born again, part of a family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. Now we're part of a family that's on its way home. Sometimes we laugh together. Sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. You know the rest of the song. But in his first letter, Peter addressed that. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, there in verse 22, he says, Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. Paul instructed the Christians at Rome to do the same thing. He said, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. That's the way we treat one another. And in capping it all off, as we're building it up, the last thing he brings out is, add to your brotherly kindness, love. I want you to think about something. Love, as Scripture speaks about it, is not the love that Paul encourages us to have, the love that Peter is talking about, is not an emotion. It is a virtue. There's a difference between the two. And here's why I say that, because you see, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that great chapter on love, he tells us what love does. He tells us how love acts, not how love feels. I don't feel this way. I don't feel that way. What does love do? Well, if you go back, he tells us that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. It does no wrong. It's not arrogant. It doesn't act unbecoming. it, uh, unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. He says it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. It, it, it rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's love. That's real love. And you know the thing he says about that love as you come to the end of chapter 13. He says that that love is the chief virtue. It's greater even than faith and hope. Now obey to faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what? Love. And those are what we incorporate into our lives. And he tells us that if these qualities are ours and they are increasing, then there is something that we can expect. There are positive results that will take place in our lives, which is what we want. And he tells us that you and I will be neither useless nor unfruitful. Useless. Have you ever told somebody you're useless? You're not any advantage to me. That word useless can mean idle. It can mean ineffective. Remember the parable that Jesus told about the workers in the, in, that were hired throughout the day and then the 11th hour workers and the, and the landowner comes back, why are you standing here? Why have you been standing here idle all day long? They're doing nothing. He says if these are ours and they are increasing, they do not render us useless. We're not idle. We're not ineffective. James says, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fe fellow, that faith without works is useless? James chapter 2, verse 20. But not only does it, do we not become useless, we aren't unfruitful. We are bearing fruit. In Galatians 2, Paul talks about not fruits of the Spirit, but fruit of the Spirit. And these virtues make up the fruit of the Spirit. And this is what is developed in our lives as we grow in Christ. And Paul told Titus that by doing good works, we make sure we're not unfruitful. As a matter of fact, in Titus chapter 3, verse 14, he said that our people, speaking about the Christians to whom Titus was preaching, must learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. That's what we've done for the last almost two years. We've met pressing needs. We have been engaged in good deeds. And I think God would say that we have been fruitful. But if these qualities are not present in our lives, then what? Peter says three things. He says we're blind. 
We're blind to the reality of the unseen world. We have no perception of spiritual things because we lack spiritual vision. You see, we as Christians are to walk by faith and not by sight, but if we're blind, we're walking by sight. We're not walking by faith. And really, we can't see, so we're blind to what is really important. He says not only are we blind, he says if we're not blind, we're at least short-sighted. And the word there for short-sighted, how many of you have myopia? I do. It means I'm short-sighted. Nearsighted, as we often say. But in a spiritual sense, we focus upon the here and now. We see what's right in front of us. We're not looking down the road of where life is going for us and where we really want to end up and how we're going to get there in the by, sweet by and by. And he says not only that, we're forgetful. We have forgotten our former purification from our sins, the fact that our sins are no more. Do you think Paul forgot his former purification from sins? Do you think he ever forgot the words that Ananias spoke to him on that day? Why tarryest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise, be baptized, and do what? Wash away your sins. I don't think he ever forgot that. As a matter of fact, many years later toward the end of his life as he writes his letter to Titus, he would add something in that letter right toward the end of it, chapter 3, verse 5. He says he saved us, that is God saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. If you look at the first letter he writes to Timothy, in the very introduction of it down in verse 15, he said, Jesus Christ came to the world. He said, this is a trustworthy statement. Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Or as the old King James says, among whom I am chief. No, he didn't forget. He knew what God had done for him. Have we forgotten what God has done for us? I hope not. My question for you is, what are we to do? Peter tells us. He says, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you or to make your calling and election sure. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Folks, what Peter is saying to you and to me is do not let God's calling you into his eternal kingdom be for naught. Don't quit, don't give up, don't walk away. If anything, be all the more diligent to keep living your life for Jesus Christ every single day because I promise you there is a reward that awaits you. It awaits all of those who are faithful and keep practicing these things that Peter's bringing out because he says if you'll practice them, you won't stumble. Satan will not have his way in your life, but if anything, ultimately, your entrance into that eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. My question for you this morning is very simple. Where are you in that process, in your Christian walk? Are you walking heavenward? Have you reached a point where you say, I just don't know if I can keep doing it. If we need to encourage you, that's what we're here to do. We want to. We don't want you to quit. We don't want you to give up. If you've not even started the journey, I want you to know there's no greater journey that you can engage upon, no greater journey that you can take up than the one that will lead you heavenward, the one that will result in eternal life. Are you willing to confess Christ as Lord and Savior? Are you willing to turn away from a life lived apart from God? Are you willing to be buried with them in baptism? If so, won't you come right now as together we stand and sing?